FX. I hope everybody's expecting to be at a session about the Camelot model. Good to see you all. I expect we'll have people coming in over the next few minutes. So uh, just a little keeping. Um, I am um, I'm recording this, so if you don't want your face on camera or if you don't want your voice in the recording, then leave things muted and um, your video off. Otherwise, um, I would very much encourage people to interact. Uh, as long as you don't have background noise, I'd love you to have your audio on. And um, I'm thinking we need someone to act as, uh, as a co-host so that we can have people admitted without me worrying about it. So Paula, would it be okay if I made you co-host? I'd be happy to help. No worries, Ta. Okay. Okay. So I will leave the co-hosting in Paula's hands. She can do the admitting of people. Um, I think you accidentally made Nesima a co-host. Oopsie. <laughs> okay. She uh, probably doesn't mind either. <laughs> okay. Let's try again. Uh, I hope I'm hitting the right button. Zoom does fluctuate on occasion. Okay, here we go. This time for sure. How's that? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Paula. Okay, so uh, we're all here to discuss the Camelot model. I'm going to sort of um, do a slideshow for about 45 minutes and hand wave and so on. Um, do feel very encouraged to interrupt, ask questions and um, uh, put your critical hat on, think hard about what we're talking about. It doesn't make any sense. Then please go, whoa, that doesn't make any sense. Um, some of what we're gonna be talking about will be very um, familiar to you and some of it probably won't be. So um, I think this is gonna be a fun session. Now, um, I'm going to go and do a share screen and like that. Let's go share. And I think in the best of all possible worlds, you can see a slide in front of you. Okay, so uh, all this is to say, um, you are encouraged to share this stuff under Creative Commons, um, non-commercial mode stuff. Um, we, um, we have a lot more material on this than we're going to do. We're trying to provide a kind of a, a bet first view of things. So we'll drill down further. Uh, there's lots of articles online, there are videos, and um, we're gonna be running a bunch of training games uh, probably in March online. So, and it's all free. And uh, uh, from our point of view, this is um, important stuff we think needs to be in the culture and is kind of missing at the moment. So we'll explain why, well, I guess now. Uh, so uh, let's see, I should probably say one of the reasons that it's called the Camelot model, if you've ever seen the film Monty Python and the Holy Grail, it's only a model. We need to motivate. Uh, if it's a model that doesn't solve the problem, then who cares? So the problem we're trying to get at is bureaucracy. Um, I don't know whether you guys have seen uh, Jerry Pornell's Iron Law before. It's a little bit depressing. It makes me feel like oh, we're all doomed. Our organization going to move in this direction and we won't be able to stop them. Um, there's a lot of game theoretic reasons to think that actually, uh, as agile practitioners, there's a lot we can do to both stop the march of bureaucracy and to move bureaucracies into a state of um, learning and self-management. And we're going to look at some of the patterns for that today. We're not going to look very deeply at the um, game theoretic aspects, but there's a site called the Evolution of Trust and I encourage you to go and have a look at that. If you just Google evolution of trust, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. And there are a lot of patterns to do with reward models, generically referred to as open book management, uh, throughput accounting, lots of things that you can do to help organizations move quite apart from the structural stuff, the concrete stuff we're talking about today. And if you were in the 
uh, descaling manifesto session a couple of weeks ago, then you'll have an idea about the context around this. If you need that context, then the, that recording is available online. So um, I'm not going to go and read the screen. I'm assuming you guys are, are good at reading screens by yourselves. But um, the idea that bureaucracy is um, inevitable, well, maybe in a world it is because uh, COVID has made a lot of things cause bureaucracy a great deal worse. Uh, and you might be wondering, well, what's so bad about bureaucracy? We'll get to that too. Um, in Zoom rooms, as you are painfully aware right now, it's very difficult to get more than one person to talk at a time. You can type things into the chat and I encourage you to do that. Uh, but there's a real bottleneck on the ability for people to communicate face to face. Well, it's true that um, I can see some of your faces and um, you can see some of each other's faces. Uh, it's not the same thing. Uh, if you're sitting in a, a room full of people, there's so much nonverbal communication going on between people's faces. People are constantly checking to see how others are receiving what's been. It's much easier to interrupt without appearing to be rude. Um, and you can segment conversations in a much more forthright way than you can like this. So that bottleneck means that um, the flow of learning really gets heavily interrupted. Now, I would like to think that learning is flowing from me to you, but that's not the kind of learning I'm talking about. I'm talking about learning uh, in the sense of um, dealing with changing conditions, uh, responding to change, is one of the four manifesto values over following a plan. So that idea of responding to change that requires intelligent, considered and mutually beneficial response to change in the sense of a learning organization. And that's the kind of learning that is being crimped by this bottleneck. So um, that stops the organization responding to those changes, and in particular, responding to changing market conditions. And in the VUCA world we presently inhabit, there's nothing but changing market conditions. So as agilists, we like to think that our little teams are really, really good at responding to change. And if we can just make certain that they're, they're, they're the right size and they've got a few other nice attributes, they're actually really good at doing that. I'm not saying they're not. I'm saying that when you have many little teams all involved in the same program, the same stream, the same business, the same organization, that they tend to fall out of alignment and their ability to um, work together to coherently respond to change is dramatically reduced. So that produces something like this scary animation. Um, basically, Business agility, which we define as the um, capability to respond to market conditions, that's really what's suffering here. And those of you who follow State of Agile survey might be pretty well aware that there's a scarily low number that's been attached to the capability to respond to changing conditions that's come out of that survey over the last three or four years. And the number wobbles around about 5% of respondents to that survey, which is the largest and longest running survey of Agilists in the entire culture. 5% uh, thereabouts say that Agile helps their organization respond to changing market conditions. After 20 years of Agile, we ought to reflect on the idea that that's a very bad number and there's something very wrong with what we're doing if all of the uh, team level agile, it's scaling agile, enterprise agile, and all the transformations only produce a 5% uh, response on responding to change. We had a crisis before COVID. So um, I'm not gonna dwell on that depressing animation, I'm going to move on. Um, I'm gonna to suggest to you that there is a kind of management function that is lacking and that it's a self-management function in the sense of self-organization. 
So um, I have a strange picture on the screen and it doesn't look like too many of the Agile teams. I expect that you're used to coaching if you're a coach. Um, but that's not to say that these people are not incredibly agile and that they didn't maintain uh, an agile civilization for, um, well, they're still around today. We're looking at uh, an illustration of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. They're a First Nations people in North America. At their height, uh, they were around about a half a million people, all working with one single, simple self-management system they called the Great Law of Peace. I want to talk just a little bit about what they did, but I am not suggesting for a moment that we all become Haudenosaunee. The French called them Iroquois, which means snakes or Iroquois is what you often hear in the Western movies, but um, it's not a complimentary word. So uh, if, um, if I use it, it's only for reference. Although um, they've kind of reappropriated it and gone, well, we'll refer to ourselves and some related First Nations people as Iroquoian people. But um, this picture has a lot of really interesting symbolism in it. And some of it uh, reflects on the patterns we're going to discuss today, but uh, I, I'm more sort of setting the stage. And I want to do a little bit more stage setting before we uh, get into the, the depths of things. So this is um, a picture or a diagram of a Haudenosaunee village uh, around about the middle of the 17th century. And it might surprise you to see that these people didn't live in tents um, roving around the plains. They weren't nomads, they weren't uh, hunters and collectors. They had permanent settlements. They uh, had very advanced uh, agricultural systems and um, their society had a structure that we could not imitate if we wanted to. Um, they had a, a method of marriage that um, just doesn't jibe with what we do. So the, the, the way they did things was uh, if you were born into a Haudenosaunee clan, there was at least three clans in every Haudenosaunee nation. Uh, you regarded all of the people in your clan as immediate family, um, your brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles and parents and so on. Um, if you were male, you weren't allowed to marry into your own clan. You had to marry into one of the other clans. If you're female, then you would stay in the clan you were born into. And there are some uh, Indian systems. I mean, India, the continent, uh, that um, that work a little bit like this as well. So the effect was this really dense social weave where everybody in the society was regarded as either your brother or your sister, your mother or your father, your auntie, your uncle or your cousin. Um, and they treated each other this way. You might think that sounds a bit unlikely with the half a million people in the society, but a lot of the trick was the way that the society was structured. And so there's a set of patterns we call descaling we're going to touch on that are inspired by some of what these guys did. So the, the unit of the society was actually one of these structures. This, this is a, 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 a two-story wooden structure called a longhouse. And, um, down the middle of the longhouse, there was usually a, a set of five open fires. And there was a very clever system of vents and chimneys that meant that the smoke from the fires didn't wind up um, killing everybody inside. It was cleverly vented to the outside. Um, and so these places were snug and warm and secure, uh, even in the most bitter winters. Each of these fires had an apartment on either side, kind of like if you took um, uh, what we would call in Australia a block of flats and laid it down sideways. Um, and these apartments, each apartment was occupied by a single family, um, um, four to six people, children, parents, grandparents, that sort of thing. Um, so each of these longhouses would have about 50 people in it. Um, and if you're thinking in Dunbar series terms, you could think that each of those families was like a team and uh, you would have um, three such teams would usually make up a, a little work group and then a, a functional unit um, would be a single longhouse. So basically uh, a longhouse was a group of people who worked together 
usually to a common outcome, most of their interests were aligned. But as I said before, uh, most of well, all of the males in the longhouse had married in from other clans. And so uh, there was a natural tension there. And the way that they solved that tension was to think of the clans as cutting across the longhouses. And so um, the neat thing then was to make decisions at every level of the society, beginning with the longhouse, there would be a little council uh, of um, the chiefs of the clans. Those chiefs were not self-appointed. They were picked by the females of the society. The clan mother for each clan would pick the chief that would attend a particular council. And unlike our parliaments, you would only have five people at each of these little councils, no matter what level of society we're talking about. So not to go into very much more depth, um, we're looking at a village. And as you can see, the village has a number of longhouses on one side and on the other. And it's kind of like what's going on inside a longhouse where you've got the row of fires and apartments on either side. So a village is effectively a longhouse of longhouses. And the way these guys did their governance, the way they did their management was through a set of treaties. And the trick was that a treaty established for the people within a longhouse could not be overridden by a treaty between the longhouses. So you had a natural concept of autonomy baked into the social structure um, that at every level, uh, a level above could not um, uh, boss around the level below. The entire society was based on this idea of mutually beneficial treaties. Often the treaties would be bartered. So if you've ever heard of wampum, wampum was not cash. Wampum was effectively a way of describing a contract between a group of people. And you could say, well, we would consider this contract if you would consider that contract. And there were little councils to trade these things. And that's most of what happened at councils. There are other things and we'll touch on those too. But I think you've got a bit of a picture. I wanna scale up if you like. So this is a single village um, on the banks of the Mohawk River. Um, and as you can see, there are a bunch of other villages and so the villages on each side of the river, they thought of those villages as a longhouse, a longhouse of longhouses of longhouses. And the clan structure we talked about being cut across the longhouses at every level. So you could assemble a council at every level. You could have a, a, a longhouse council, you could have a, a village council, a tribal council, because a tribe was the longhouse of longhouses of longhouses. And again, the same idea applied that you've got alignment through treaties between autonomous villages now. And so those treaties uh, were negotiated at the tribal council and tribal councils would run uh, usually five to six times a year, coinciding with various harvest festivals. So these were a very social people. Uh, well, they didn't start out that way. I should say the 13th century, these people were cannibals and they fought violent civil wars for centuries before they evolved this thing called the great law of peace. If you've ever heard of a poem called the Song of Hiawatha by a, a, a European named Longfellow, that's not about the historical Hiawatha. Longfellow just liked the cadence of the name, it fit into his poem better. The historical Hiawatha though, uh, was one of the three people who came up with this idea of this great law of peace. And um, it was an incredibly effective, agile system. Uh, it operated um, autonomously. I mean, as a as a <coughs> bless you, as a confederacy uh, of nations uh, for over five centuries, including two centuries of interruption with Europeans. Um, and it really only came to grief um, during the American War of Independence, when couldn't decide what to do with uh, the treaties they had with the British when the British had split into two halves. And they, unfortunately, uh, Hiawatha and so on were long dead. They didn't necessarily have, had the, have the system thinkers they needed to deal with that particular issue. And they wound up with a split in the Confederacy itself. The Confederacy looks like this. 
Well, on a European map, it looks like this. Uh, Seneca, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Mohawk, those are the five original uh, Haudenosaunee nations. And um, uh, there was a sixth nation made up of immigrants because the Haudenosaunee lived an enviable form of life um, to give you a or lifestyle, to give you an idea. A lot of the immigrants were actually Europeans, especially European women, because in European society in North America, uh, uh, during the two centuries before the War of Independence, uh, women couldn't own property. Women didn't have an, uh, any political voice. Uh, they were, to all intents and purposes, chattels. And um, when they joined the Haudenosaunee, they became uh, politically empowered. And they didn't have to cook and clean for uh, the men. They did, had a really clever system where the women basically owned everything inside the villages and the men controlled everything that happened outside the villages. So there was a really not nice division of labor and balance of powers. And we'll come to that pattern again a little bit later. But this is a European map of the Haudenosaunee. And I promise I'll stop talking about Haudenosaunee in just a moment. But I wanna show you this one. This is a Haudenosaunee map. Uh, of their society. Um, each of the beads in this um, uh, uh, circle wampum, um, each of the beads represents, as far as I can figure out, um, a, a village. And so each, each string of beads represents a tribe. And so you can see that there are five dots separating the, the groups of strings of beads. Um, so those basically separate the, the nations, the original nations of the Confederacy. So we're looking at um, a, 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 a civilization that was held together by treaties, treaties um, within each of these villages, treaties between the villages to, uh, that, that made up a tribe, which is to say along a single water course or a single geological feature, um, usually a water course, uh, and then treaties between the tribes within a nation and treaties between the nations. And at every uh, level, the treaties at one level could not override the treaties at the level below. Now, um, I am not for a moment suggesting that, um, well, these guys, they invented democracy as far as I can figure out, not the Greek style democracy, but modern democracy um, really started here. Their ideas were tremendously influential uh, on the form of the American government, but they also via Rousseau uh, caused the French Revolution uh, uh, via Marx. They caused the Russian Revolution. Marx and Engels wrote extensively about the Haudenosaunee. Uh, Stanton and Mott, the ladies who started the suffragette movement, um, uh, they uh, modeled a lot of their ideas on the Haudenosaunee. So this is not just some obscure First Nations uh, tribe. They've been enormously influential on the former civilization we enjoy today. There are some patterns we can mine from the way they did things. So let's move in that direction. Let's think about patterns. Um, now, uh, some of you are well aware that Agile started in the, the, the patterns, the Alexandrian patterns movement. Um, there was a, a group of people um, mainly led by Ward Cunningham, but there were other leading lights there too, also manifesto signatories who uh, ran a series of conferences for five or 10 years before uh, the, the birth of this thing we call Agile. Um, and a lot of the early Agile books were talked in terms of patterns. Um, there is a thing called Scrum Plop, I think it is, um, with the pattern languages of um, um, uh, Scrum. So basically this idea of pattern is very simple. It's just a well-proven, solution to a well-known commonplace problem in a certain context. That's the sense in which we're talking patterns. And they're a neat concept because they give us an ability to think outside of the context of frameworks. We can just think we've got a language or a toolkit of patterns and we don't need to apply a pattern unless we're experiencing the problem that it solves. And there are many alternative patterns for solving problems. So it gives us a way to think about tailoring um, our solutions uh, in Agile to um, uh, 
uh, to the specific needs of our clients rather than going, oh, well, you just have to do all of these things and all dance in a row and you'll, it'll be Swan Lake and you'll be very happy with each other. We all know that doesn't work. Um, a lot of the work that we do um, is in spite of rather than because of the frameworks and I'm not gonna bang on that drum any louder. There's an awful lot more I could say on that score, but right now we're going to talk simple things, um, things we can actually do, uh, things that are useful. And if, um, if you start thinking, well, hey, could these things all fit together? Well, that's the model we're going to look at in the last part of this presentation. And then I'm going to throw the floor open and, um, uh, and I'm hoping we can have some interesting roundtable discussions then. But uh, if we need to, I don't know how many people, how many people do we have on the call at the moment, Paula? You're muted. 32. Okay, so uh, we, we could do some breakout rooms if we want to. Uh, if you guys don't wanna hang around, that's okay too. So we'll, we'll basically, we'll see how many people are left at the end. I'd love to do that if you guys would like to. Um, so self-management, we're going to talk about um, three patterns that minimize friction costs of learning, or I should say the flow of learning through the organization. Um, I, I like to talk about triple loop learning where um, you're familiar with double loop from the old scrum diagram, um, the, the flow of value and the workflow. Well, we think that there is a third loop, which is the flow of learning through the organization. And the beautiful thing about the third loop is that we can measure it. There are metrics for it and we can accelerate it. And being able to accelerate it is more powerful than accelerating workflow in a single part of the organization or value flow in a single stream because it acts to accelerate all of those things. Uh, and there's a lot of historical precedents we'll be talking, we could be talking about from the context of uh, the Japanese tea tradition and so on. We talked about some of that stuff at um, the, the Descaling Manifesto uh, session a couple of weeks ago. We're not gonna revisit it now. So uh, leadership as a service, you guys are very familiar with servant leadership. Well, there isn't a protocol for servant leadership and a lot of the people we try to coach to be servant leaders don't do a very good job of it. So leadership as a service is a protocol for servant leadership and it's a really simple one. And the reason that we worry about that is that it's something we can apply not just within a team, but across multiple teams and actually across whole organizations and it can be applied at many different levels. We've used this for PMOs, for executive teams. There's um, really um, the same sorts of meeting problems occur at every level. So being able to, um, to provide simple solutions at every level is hideously powerful. And to give you a, a, an idea, um, uh, Masa Maido is one of the members of one of the coaches in Xscale Alliance. Masa took uh, leadership as a service patterns into a group of 13 vice presidents at Prado Banco uh, in South America, uh, a group that had been politically polarized for many years before he turned up. And, um, I, I think it was six weeks after he introduced these patterns that turned what was a pilot gig into a two year engagement for him. So this was something that convinced executives, not by Masa giving a big song and dance, but by their actually using it and doing it. Um, and um, so the outcomes we get from this really simple protocol are dramatic. Uh, and once you learn the patterns, which you will learn, learn in just a, a couple of minutes, um, it's not like you could forget them. They're, 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 they're that bog simple. So then Camelot is about learning flows between teams and between uh, organizational units at multiple levels. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, let's talk about descaling. The first of these patterns I expect is familiar to all of us and we all expect and love the idea that that's how you construct uh, effective teams. Um, I don't think there's a single person on this call who hasn't seen massive resistance from clients when it comes to this pattern. And particularly if we try to apply this outside of the context of software delivery, where you can say, well, you know, there are qualities 
reasons for it uh, or design reasons for it, uh, we get big pushback. Um, but at the same time, this solves a um, learning friction problem in a way that you can't beat. Uh, it's in the manifesto that business and technology should meet together on a daily basis. Well, that's really talking about people with um, uh, different kinds of functional responsibilities. So it would include functional responsibilities at every level if we apply it consistently, HR and CFO's office and legal and marketing and so on. People who um, rely on um, interaction between each other's functions we can apply the same pattern there as well. And I don't think that'll come as a surprise to anyone. Of course, the question is, well, how do you actually motivate them to do it? Um, that's something that we call, um, uh, well, there are a number of names for it we're not gonna get into in this session. Uh, Seven Samurai Kanban, uh, pull transformation, self-propagating transformation. There's a lot of things um, that we will talk about in other sessions, but um, not this one. Apologies, we only have a certain amount of time. So, um, so a neat, simple pattern that everybody here understands. Now you have an idea what I mean by a pattern if you didn't know what I meant before. Um, mission command. We're used to the idea that armies, um, people who've been in, in military aren't necessarily used to this idea, but you're used to the trope that um, military is very stiff and unresponsive to change. And uh, people who actually have direct experience know that's, uh, horribly false, that, that's completely false, that actually if military was as stiff-necked as it's often portrayed, um, well, uh, it would lose to militaries that were more agile. Um, so the, the main pattern we're interested in here is the distance between doers and deciders. Uh, there was a guy named von Moltke uh, in the 19th century, who was a Prussian field marshal who invented this thing called Auftrag's tactic. Basically, this meant this was uh, the days when people would line up opposite each other on a field or like pieces on a chessboard and shoot at each other. And von Moltke thought that was pretty stupid. And so he had this idea that you would hand out missions to small teams, you would say they're autonomous and they just had to go and achieve their mission. And if they achieve one mission, they might have some more that they would achieve after that. So they wouldn't have to report back to the deciders for a long time. And of course, this was a tremendous strategic advantage. It didn't really get into um, uh, common parlance in the military until the Second World War, um, when a lot of the, the tactics the Nazis used uh, really dramatized the fact this worked. When they, when they took France in five days, a lot of that was because of Outrag's tactic. And I am not for a moment saying that agile Nazis are a good thing. Agile Nazis are not a good thing. Um, uh, happily, um, from the generals up to Hitler, they were command and control all the way. And that's why uh, Dunkirk and that's why the Russian front and so on, all of the spectacular collapses of the Nazis were because they weren't agile. Hooray, good, glad Nazis don't tend to be agile. Anyway, this idea of giving full autonomy to solve specific problems to small teams, again, nice, simple, obvious, well-proven practice pattern. At the same time, um, this again is something that we don't see very much in, well, or at all in bureaucracies, but uh, it's something that a lot of managers feel uncomfortable with. So how do we motivate it? Well, again, that's a really interesting question and I'm delighted to talk about it outside of the, when we get into Q and A, outside the context of, of this, but I wanna give you a breadth first view of this stuff and we can come back to that question. Um, and then we've got the Dunbar series. Well, now a lot of people have heard of something called the Dunbar number, uh, which supposedly is 150 and um, I asked Robin Dunbar about this when I interviewed him at the start of last year. Um, and he said that 150 is not the Dunbar number if you're talking about a functional work group. It might be a structural unit in a business, but it's not a group of people you would expect to work together for some common end. That number would be three times smaller. It would be 50, 60 thereabouts. So the Dunbar number, the uh, every framework 
provider has been handing out ever since uh, Niebuhr got it wrong in the Spotify videos. It's just wrong, um, which is a very sad thing, but it also explains why a lot of the Spotify model deployments didn't work too well. Um, well, so what Dunbar said was that um, there is a power series when it comes to um, social units that, that to have a self-organizing team, you want five or six people. And there's a lot of data to support this. And I could trot out a bunch of data, but you can go looking for that stuff or just go looking through Dunbar's papers online. He's professor of evolutionary psychology at Oxford. So he's not difficult to find. And I was amazed when I, when I braced him at the start of last year and I said, well, I want to talk about this agile thing. You've probably heard about it. No, no agilist had actually gone and interviewed Dunbar. <sighs> so you can find my interview with Dunbar on YouTube. And uh, he's a very nice man uh, and uh, he's not some historical figure. Anyway, basically his idea was or is that when you look at human society, the way things tend to organize, they, um, they organize in terms of groups of three. So um, and it has to do with social grooming. It's not just about the size of a cerebellum. It's how much time you have to put into maintaining trust relationships. So if you think about uh, babysitting, you, there's probably five or six people in the world that you would trust to babysit your baby. And there's no more than that. Um, so that kind of tight knit, your inner circle is typically five or six people. Um, and we saw that in the Horton Shawnee picture as well. Well, um, then you have things that are more like um, uh, football teams or baseball teams or things that tend to be around about uh, three times that size. So around about 15 to 20 people. Um, and, and that's, I, I like to think of that as a, a good size for a business stream. If you have three little teams working together, the problem is how do you get those three teams to continuously align? That's, that's a problem we're going to be looking at in just a moment. If you start to say, well, we want four teams, we want five teams, we want nine teams. Well, that's not going to work very well if you're expecting them to align continuously. And then you wind up with these bureaucratic command and control structures to try and force them to align. And you have all these middlemen and that slows down the flow of learning. So the idea with the Dunbar series is actually, if we just work on these powers of three groupings, we have a lot easier time getting people to self-align and self-manage. We don't need all these middlemen. That's not to say that managers are not useful. They're enormously useful. Um, and we have a pattern for making use of them we're gonna talk about in just a moment. Uh, so this is not about let's fire the managers. It is about how do we empower the teams to do a lot of the management function themselves continuously. So, um, and there's plenty of examples for the Dunbar series. And again, I don't need to go into that in a great amount of detail. Um, any questions before I go on? I'll keep going. Okay. So uh, the next three patterns we're going to look at are leadership as a service. And you might go, why three patterns? And the answer is, because I think it's easy to understand things in threes. Um, so uh, maybe there are other patterns in these categories that you think are important and I would love to hear about them. Um, so uh, when we throw the floor open, maybe we can have some working groups on that if we've got enough people. Directly responsible individuals. This is a pattern that as far as I know was pioneered by jobs at Next and then at Apple. A very simple idea. Um, in any meeting, you'll you have to identify a set of agenda items explicitly. And every agenda item has to have one of the people at the meeting directly responsible for its execution. And so the idea is that there's no chickens, if you think of the pigs and chickens metaphor. Uh, if, if you're not a DRI for some agenda item at the meeting, you have no reason for being at that meeting. You can go do something else. Um, so uh, Jobs was famous for throwing people out of meetings if they weren't a, a DRI. Um, but this is a really simple, really powerful idea because it eliminates committee think rather than people going, well, we are going to do this thing. 
and we will make these decisions and we'll wibble and wobble around because not a single one of us is the champion for the thing we're making decisions about. If you are the directly responsible individual for the thing that your team is meeting about, you're gonna have a very strong opinion. And we have a pattern for balancing that in just a moment. If we do things this way, then uh, the, the quote here, a committee is a form of life with six or more legs and no brain comes from Robert Heinlein. Um, the, that experience we've all had of sitting in meetings and going, these people that are stupid. Or if you just, if you watch The Office, you see this kind of uh, committee thing happening all the time. If you have directly responsible individuals, it can't happen because people know who is going to wear the result of the decision and they'll stand up. But how do you balance uh, the, um, to refer to Star Trek, because you have to put some Star Trek into uh, your session every once in a while, the needs of the many against the needs of the few or the one. How do you do that on a daily basis? Um, you see this uh, in agile uh, software delivery uh, whenever you get to estimation. Uh, you're doing planning poker. Um, yes, no estimates works, hooray. But you still see similar things in a no estimates context. Basically, you have some people in the team think that it's, a, I'm going to talk planning poker, it's a three, and some people say it's a 13, and they get polarized, and there's each has their own little supporters and their little clique, and they're butting heads, and it doesn't matter how many rounds of poker you run. And as a scrum master or a coach, uh, uh, you go, well, how am I going to resolve this? There are two stupid ways of resolving it, and one smart way. The two stupid ways are you could say, well, we're just going to average the estimates. Uh, maybe it, it seems like it's a five. It's a five. We'll go with five or it's an eight or whatever it is. And it's just completely ignoring the concerns that the group who say it's 13 are bringing. Uh, so that's stupid because you're not actually reconciling the forces that are in front of you. Uh, another stupid way to do it is you can say, well, let's vote. The more people who say it's a three, the more likely it is to be a three. Honk, no, wrong, go back. Um, what one thing you can do is you can say, well, this story is a database story. And Jill is our database architect. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, if Jill, um, if everybody else, if everybody else is not unanimous about the estimate, then I'm just gonna ask Jill, now, Jill will care about trying to get the estimate to be sensible. So she will try to influence everybody else. She'll say, look, you guys, I know you think you guys think it's a three, but it, it, we have to build all these extra reference data tables. That's why it's a 13. You know, you don't have to do that. I have to do that, but it's still going to slow us down. That's why it's, so she's going to be passionate since she's DRI for this story. So the same kind of trade-off happens uh, in, in a PMO, in an executive group, you can use this balance of powers pattern at any level among peers, particularly among peer DRIs. And basically all you say is, okay, we know who the DRI is for this work item or agenda item, because you could, could be work items in a backlog. Um, if the rest of you are not unanimous about the decision, then the DRI is going to decide for us. And now you have this lovely interplay where everybody knows who's going to make the decision. They know the kinds of decision that person usually makes. So they have a motivation to get unanimous. They start doing deals. And so that polarization goes away. And this is fundamental to the Haudenosaunee great law of peace. If you look, there's, there's a, a bunch of translations of this thing online. And if you look at the way their council protocol works, and it was um, fundamental to the foundation of their confederacy. Um, Basically, everybody has a veto. Uh, if the rest of the council are not unanimous, well, then the person who is sort of the speaker for the council, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, gets to decide. But that, the fact that, that they can decide if they're not unanimous, that's what motivates these guys to make their trade-offs and get unanimous. So the speaker practically never gets to decide and never gets to overrule the others. So I'll explain what I mean by speaker in a moment, because you might be going, wait a second. Is that a leader? Is that a manager? What's a speaker? So the, the idea of balance of powers uh, gives us a way 
to um, get concrete decisions made in a council uh, or a, a leadership team or a steering committee or whatever we're going to call the thing. But there are plenty of times where we don't have time to have that meeting. A decision has to be made now. There's a hostile tribe coming over the hill. They're shooting arrows at us. We don't have time to sit down and have a council meeting. So DRIs exist in a Haudenosaunee context as well. They were typically called war chiefs. And so they would make decisions for a particular uh, sized group in their society when there wasn't time to have uh, a, um, a consensus decision-making based council. And then, well, they would have to apologize for a decision afterwards. They had a regular series of things they called condolence councils where people would say things like, well, we're really sorry that we burned down your longhouse um, and killed a bunch of your people, um, but you guys shot arrows at us first thinking that we were actually, a, it was a mistake, case of mistaken identity. And now we need to replace some of the people in our society. So we'd like to, to swap a few people or whatever, however they decide to resolve their tensions. That um, idea of DRIs and balance of powers is a really nice, simple combination of patterns, but there's one missing piece. Who decides who the DRIs are, the directly responsible individuals? And that's where we have this pattern that exists in the Haudenosaunee, but exists uh, in the Westminster system as well, where there is a speaker of the house. The speaker is not the prime minister, the speaker, their power is to go, okay, well, I will accept these people are going to perform these functions for our mutual benefit. They're going to basically uh, take on direct responsibility for particular parts of the way the system works. So the idea with the speaker pattern is, and you saw this, uh, you see this in, in diagrams of Apple. Uh, basically, if someone became a directly responsible individual at a higher level of Apple, uh, well, they couldn't perform all that work, even though they're directly responsible, they couldn't perform it all by themselves. So they would have to recruit a bunch of other people to be in their team, to be directly responsible for doing parts of their, their solution. And all, that could work at multiple levels. There's a beautiful uh, interview that Jobs gave to uh, Walter Mossberg, I think it is, shortly before he died, where he said to Mossberg, we have no committees, zero committees in Apple. At the top, it works like a startup, and at every level, it works like a startup. So basically, someone at a particular level who's a directly responsible individual, they go back to their team and they go, right, I am now going to help you guys achieve this mission that I am directly responsible for. And to do that, I'm going to assign a bunch of directly responsible individuals for what I think the work items or agenda items are. And then we're going to use the balance of powers pattern to make our decisions. So basically that person is no longer the manager you have to convince to get something, some decision made to get something done. Instead, they become a pure servant leader for their team. They get to pick the, the directly responsible individuals and you might go, wait a second, that's not realistic. We can't do that in our organization. Fine, don't do it. It's only a pattern, it's just a model. So the neat thing about this is you can go, oh, well, we're going to keep our manager, it's still gonna be a manager. We're not gonna do the speaker of the house thing, or maybe we will do it when the manager isn't in the room. There's lots of variations on this stuff. So, so much for leadership as a service. Any questions before we go on? Okay, so that brings us to three more patterns and then we'll look at the model as a whole. Um, and so these patterns, the, what we've seen so far about minimizing friction costs of learning when uh, we're, we're structuring uh, an organization and uh, about accelerating the learning flow within each of the little units of the organization but the learning flow has to work between those units. Otherwise we wind up with silos. So um, the first pattern is surprisingly not very well known in the agile world. And some people think they, they know what it is from uh, holacracy or sociocracy because they, they use the word circle. But circle in the original lean sense does not mean what holacracy and sociocracy mean by circle. Um, a circle in a quality circle sense cuts across 
a group of teams at a certain level of the organization. And basically, it's a bunch of people in a similar role. Let's say if we were talking software, uh, maybe the testers would form a circle and the developers would form a circle and the analysts would form a circle, the designers would form a circle, uh, the product owners would form a circle, uh, that sort of thing. If we were talking hamburger joints, maybe the fry cooks would form a circle and the cleaners would form a circle and the retail, the front desk staff would form a circle. The lovely thing about quality circles is this is a very well attested, well proven pattern for getting learning to flow across uh, your working groups at multiple different levels. Um, and there's a lot of um, uh, people like um, the open book management people, a great game of business people uh, who've adopted quality circles as a fundamental without worrying about some of the other patterns we're talking about here. So again, it's a well-proven pattern but the neat thing is, in an agile sense, you can have these circle meetings very small. Um, what we've, we've found is that three people seems to work best for a circle meeting, no more than six. Now, if you look at the quality circle literature, they allow you to have up to 12, but that's kind of like, um, you know, Scrum says you can have three or four week iterations. No one in their right mind would, would have, have a sprint that was three weeks long. Um, but of course you could do it if you needed to, and it's made it an awful lot easier for uh, these patterns to get adopted broadly to be less precise about it. So anyway, we're going to see an illustration of three person circles in just a moment, an animation of that. Because uh, right now I'm hand waving because I'm trying to give you the breadth first, but um, uh, I, we could have had one slide for each and all of that stuff. I just figured we'll, we'll do uh, enough of a demonstration when we look at the animation to make it concrete for you. And if not, we'll talk it through further after. So, so anyway, quality circles, uh, they kind of showed up in the, the Spotify video as, as chapter meetings, which was, it was nice. It was the first time someone had kind of represented those first class. I think it was a lot of why people liked the look of the Spotify model. Um, yes, the Spotify guys all say it's not a model. And of course, these days they don't do uh, what Nieberg described at all, if they ever did. Um, and there's um, a, a lot of Spotify experienced coaches uh, who can tell you a lot of things that don't sound anything like autonomy in alignment. Um, that's fine. Uh, all I'm saying is that the, the idea of chapter meetings as a way to get people aligned before and continuously before any of the other meetings that you would do uh, that's a really neat idea. And if you do it for a small group of teams, let's say three teams, um, before those teams have their retros, then their retros can adapt to all of the learning that all of the teams have done. And that's really powerful. It means that the retros become places where people can go, hey, it's not just that we've learned something in our team, but that team over there is having this problem. And if we just change the way we're doing this, they'll have a much easier time or they've learned something we could use and they're willing to share it with us. So um, the ability to share learning across teams is sort of the, the bottom level of Camelot. We'll look at multiple levels in just a moment. So um, that's great, but those little circles can't make decisions for the teams and the teams can't make decisions for each other if we're going to observe autonomy. We're trying to avoid delegating decisions to middle managers, not to say the middle managers aren't useful, they are, but we want self-management. That's the fundamental for getting learning to flow. And that's going to make the middle an awful lot more valuable, a lot, it's gonna make their life a lot easier because they don't have to do the constant dance between the different teams to, to make things work um, and to solve stupid problems that come up over and over again. The teams can do that for themselves. So uh, round councils, uh, the problem is we want to minimize the doer decider distance across multiple teams. Um, and uh, there are some examples that I can't say are exactly this pattern. They're close. Um, uh, in the Haudenosaunee Great Law, there is the ability for people to, to sort of go in and out of councils to have um, horns removed from their head by the clan mother. But it doesn't happen every every council meeting. 
Um, and Genshi Genbutsu, uh, the idea of it comes from lean of uh, management by walking around, that you would have the deciders would be going to all the doers, understanding the problems by going to the Gemba. Uh, that's a really powerful pattern. But the idea of getting representatives of quality circles to visit with the deciders on a regular basis and to make decisions together uh, on a regular basis in a little council meeting. The reason that I'm raising this pattern is because we've used this in Xscale Alliance uh, in the Game Without Thrones over the last five years. And we found this to be a really strong pattern once you've got quality circles in place. So if you know of any other examples of this, I am all ears and I would love to hear from you. Um, and we're going to look at, at how this works in more detail in just a moment. Um, and then treaty governance. So this is one we get from the Haudenosaunee, uh, their great law of peace, but there's also um, an, a, a, a less formal method for doing this that is very common in Dutch organizations um, where they get representatives of government and union and employer together to make consensus decisions. And the, the basic idea is that we're trying to work out a working agreement. You can see this done in much more depth in things like Ren Den He Yi, uh, the, the higher method, and uh, things like um, the Mayakawa uh, system of uh, dopos and blocks, uh, where basically what they're trying to do is work out ways of working that are gonna maximize the business throughput for the group, never mind about making one team's life or another team's life easier. This is really around how do we negotiate treaties that are going to be for mutual benefit. Of course, you have to motivate mutual benefit before that's going to be useful. And we were talking before about we, we need some ways to motivate some of these patterns. One way you can motivate uh, this idea of treaty governance or working agreements is um, by rewarding people, they're giving, hooking their bonus up to business throughput for their entire business stream or their entire business unit or their entire organization as a whole, their entire business. Um, and there are a lot of examples of doing that. Apple uh, did that, for example. Um, uh, the Great Game of Business includes that. Um, a, a lot of things like the Mondragon Collective uh, and Birdsorg, they do that. The beautiful thing about it is that then everybody is motivated to work together at every level to, um, to get the most effective flow of value to market. So uh, treaty governance is something we can look at as a responsibility of one of these councils. So let's, let's go and play with um, an animation to, to have an idea about what this might look like. Before I do, uh, any questions before we go on? I'll take that for a, we're fine. Okay, so let's take Steve Jobs at his word and think in terms of lean startup, build, measure and learn. I wanna add one extra verb there, simplify. Um, in XP, we had this idea of merciless refactoring um, and that, that was, it was critical to be able to minimize the cost of quality you don't see that in Lean Startup because startups are trying to get out of the garage. Um, and um, it, it's often left out of conversations about um, uh, Agile and very much to the cost of our clients. I, anyone who's uh, tried to do DevOps without this idea of continuous merciless refactoring, or for that matter, automation and simplification, uh, understands that uh, this really is sort of the zeroth way of DevOps. Um, for now, we're not going to go down a DevOps path. Um, I want you to think about simplification in terms of the functions of the organization. So simplifying the business, simplifying the way that the organization transforms. Um, that idea of simplification has to be merciless, continuous, baked into what we're doing. So self-directing programs or self-managing streams of self-organizing teams, that's the vision. How do we go about doing that? We've seen some patterns that might be useful for going in that direction. Let's try and understand something about how we could plug them together in a kind of a, a fractal. 
So we're going to look at a life cycle that's made up of the patterns we just discussed. So to begin with, really, really bog simple life cycle. We want to build, measure and learn. We want um, uh, quality circles to meet, to share learning across the teams that are doing the build, measure, learn. Um, and then we want each team to have retrospectives or its retrospective after the quality circles so the teams can adapt to each other's needs and align to common concerns and to a common business outcome. So uh, here I've got three teams and uh, this is very much, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's quite literally we're thinking in terms of Dunbar and you might go, wait a second, three teams of six, that's not very many people. I've got 2000 people in my organization uh, I've got to get them to align. I'm an enterprise coach. The three teams of six each is not going to help me. Hold on, we're, 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 get, we're getting there. We have to start somewhere. So, and I, that also goes for um, transformation work. It's often better to start with a steel thread of capability with just a few people involved, get it working properly and then grow it. And so as we look at the next couple of diagrams, you can think about that idea of growing capability in a literal sense. There's more to say about it we're not gonna cover in this session. So here we've got people moving into quality circles from those three teams. And you might go, what do those weird symbols mean, Pete? Um, maybe the dollar symbol is the, the, the product owners or the, the, the customers, they, they want the business to work. Maybe the little atom symbol, those could be our data scientists. And the uh, one with the, the little, um, uh, sort of uh, S, those could be um, uh, growth curves for a business stream. Maybe those are our business analysts. Uh, the little Prince design symbol, I hope we don't get sued by his estate. Um, that, those could be our designers. And the little sort of Freemasonic architect symbol, well, those could be our architects. Uh, and the little sergeant symbol, maybe those are our security people. Or maybe those symbols mean something completely different that's relevant to a hamburger joint. Um, and that's fine. Uh, I'm using abstract symbols because this isn't necessarily about software. Quality circles work for any kind of business and every level of any kind of business. So, uh, but keeping them small is really great. And this idea of three people is something we discovered uh, when we tried variations on this with two and four and five uh, with the game Without Thrones. What we discovered was that Three works better. Um, if you think about when you go along to a conference or a dinner party or cocktail party, whatever it is, and someone strikes a conversation with you and you're having this conversation about whatever it is, and a third person walks up. The third person's sort of playing catch up on the conversation. And they're thinking about where is this conversation going next? And so they're just waiting to jump in and add a, a, a new thread of conversation. And then someone will start uh, interacting with them it kind of leaves one of the other original two people out and they start thinking strategically about where is this conversation going? So having three people, you get this really neat flow of learning. Um, you can actually work a, a Kanban with three people in the sense of sharing learning. And we do in the game without thrones, but you don't need a Kanban to do it. It's just a really neat unit of um, learning flow. So um, after the quality circles, we have retros. Well, those are just team retros, nothing particularly spectacularly different about this, except that the retros are informed by the learning across the teams. So that the teams will be continuously changing their way of working to adapt to each other's needs. And if they are focused on a common business stream or a common epic within that stream, uh, an epic, uh, I don't mean it in a fuzzy way, uh, I like to think of epics in terms of why, who, how, what. If you're familiar with Goiko Adzik's impact mapping idea, we think of uh, the, the why, who, how, what as a, the normal form for an epic, but I'm not going to go into that right now. We might do a session on 3D Kanban later. Um, okay, so the life cycle we've talked about so far, uh, delivery circles, retrospectives, that's left out self-management because self-management as these needs, we have to prioritize things. And um, that means we have to analyze them, chop them into pieces with uh, uh, acceptance criteria, well-specified 
hopefully using a sort of a BDD process. And then we need to estimate not just the budget we need to deliver a feature, but the business value of a feature. We have to combine business value and budget to be able to prioritize our features in order of decreasing ROI. And you might go, wait a second, that doesn't sound like Liz Jeff Pig. It doesn't, does it? Um, that's a different story. If you want to understand that, go and look at my article on, on business bingo. Uh, you can deliver an awful lot more ROI that way than you'll ever get out of WizGIF. And um, I'm happy to show you the numbers on it if you're interested in that, but that's not for today. Simplification. We talked about uh, continuous, merciless automation, integration, refactoring. Uh, this is a critical function for any kind of delivery work, uh, software delivery work, but it also applies to hamburgers because you want to make certain that every part of the hamburger cooking process is automated. Uh, you have integration problems. Uh, maybe um, the, 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 the French fryer with all the hot oil is getting in the way of the people trying to take the hamburger patties out of the freezer and they keep getting splashed with hot oil. That's an integration problem. And you want to deal with it with uh, refactoring. So you want to be thinking continuously around how do we improve the design of our existing system, our existing process? Um, and then coordination. Well, we've all got all these proposals that are coming out of teams and circles, and we need some way to revise them, say work together, to reorganize around the result. And we want some group of people to ratify whether we're actually going to go with one of these proposals for changing the way we're working or not. So these, this, these are the functions of self management we've identified as very commonplace. Um, it might be that you go, well, actually, self management has to involve a bunch of reporting upwards. That's fine. But um, what we want to think about is how can we get these embodied in concrete, little, meetings that'll just get the decisions made. So let's see what that can look like. Um, here we've got our uh, three teams, we've got our quality circles, and after the quality circles, but before the retros, we could do something like this. We could say, well, what we want is for uh, each team to be represented on this council. And what we'd like is that each circle is represented on the council because that way all of our conversations are about the proposals that the circles made for different ways of working or for uh, new features or changes in priorities of features they can all be discussed face to face we don't have to write these things down or memorize them uh, the intent here is that self-management is a process that works through conversation as much as possible using the manifesto ideas about face to face is the best way to communicate within and between teams. So you might go, well, that's great, but these people on this round council are going to turn into managers almost immediately. And you're right, they are, unless every time we hold one of them, we do this. And that's why we call it a round council. So the idea is that everybody gets a turn. And you might go, well, yeah, but some of our people need to be on this council permanently. Like we have an architect that serves these three teams. They need to be on the council permanently. That's fine. Of course you can do that. This is only a pattern. It's only a model. Now you might go, well, that means we're going to have more than six people on the council. Not necessarily. You might only have three circles in your teams. It's, it's just a model. So um, we're just trying to look at how we could apply these patterns. And this is the model we use with the game Without Thrones but that's because we want to demonstrate this stuff in a way that you can actually experience in a two or three hour period. Um, it's not the only way you can use these patterns. So you might go, wait a second, all this rotation, that's going to require a lot of, how do you track that? That's going to, who goes to which council when? Um, well, actually we, we, we initially discovered we could do it uh, just using a, a simple set of cards but we have an, an automation of that, uh, combining uh, the, the, the Slack alternative called Discord, uh, it's easier to script, and Miro, uh, and we have some X-Scale coaches working on uh, doing that open source at the moment. But uh, the whole intent with this stuff is uh, to make it easy for people to work like this online, because six people in a Zoom room, that works okay. 
Seven people gets an awful lot harder. And above that, it doesn't work. So um, the neat thing about this is we can apply leadership as a service, those patterns within the council, the same way that we apply them within the team. So that gives us the way that the council makes its decisions without having to say, well, who's the manager of that council? It doesn't need one. It does need someone to, to act as speaker, but that can, role can rotate as well. It's a really simple role. Um, so, so far so good, everybody's happy? All right. Peter, yes. um, I think a lot of people are interested in the simulation and are wondering how they can be informed about that simulation. Beautiful. So um, I've got just a couple of slides left and we'll talk about that in more detail, but basically uh, in March, we're going to run some nice public online Game Without Thrones, probably about 60 people each session. Uh, 60 is enough to have all of the self-management problems come out full force so you get to use this stuff in anger. And uh, having run this with Lego uh, many times over the last five years since we first came up with it in Exca Alliance, uh, we, we can put a hand on heart and say it really, really works and it's amazing and it's huge fun. Um, but let me show you a little bit more of a picture and we'll come back to that. We haven't actually scheduled the sessions yet because we're still play testing the online version with the coaches in Exca Alliance. So uh, let's say we've got here three teams and we've got these six circles. You might go, why do these circles look different to what we had before? Uh, well, they look different because we've got a little clock and uh, as these guys rotate, because we'll just rotate them like that, then you'll see who's going to uh, the refactoring session, who's, so I should say simplification session. I, I, I changed the term a little while ago, so I apologize. If you see refactoring, it means simplification. Who's going to that council? Who's going to the, um, uh, the coordination council? Who's going to the prioritization council? Basically, this is a way to get those councils to run in parallel. Well, that's more complicated than a lot of people need. So for example, in College Board, uh, Kamada Detatran ran this there and they didn't need to have more than one council at a time. To tell the truth, they didn't have cross-functional teams. So, but that rotation of people onto the council from their circles, which were their teams, uh, that worked a treat and they love it. And they've been using it for, oh, for about a year now. So uh, the, the idea for a game without thrones as we separate these functions out so that everybody has something to do in these little five minute periods that we use uh, in, in the game. But you could have all three of these functions running in a single council, if you like, and people could take turns entering that council and there's lots of ways of doing that, that's okay. So let's say, as we said before, this is good for more than just three teams. So let's say that I've got nine teams of six. That's 50, 60 people, something like that. Um, and each of them can be aligning within, let's say each, each of these has a responsibility. Each of these groups of three teams has a responsibility to deliver uh, a single epic in the sense of why, who, how, what. If you want to understand how to factor those things out, it's kind of what we do with product agility, where we work breadth first to do the factoring and develop an epic landscape, but you don't need to do all that stuff to do this. It's more a matter of um, what's a convenient way of trunking the work up so that you've got an objective for those three teams to use to align to. Let's say I've got nine teams. Uh, I want to take my objective for those nine teams in my program and chunk it into three pieces as well, because it means I can do this. I can say, okay, I'm going to have um, circles with representatives that will come from just the coordination councils for each of these. So basically the coordination councils can each go along to these circles and that's what we do in the game without thrones and we want to go um, and do an extra level of coordination. We simply say right well the people who were in this coordination council are going to go into these stream level circles and then they'll go and attend stream level councils and we can do that self similarly you might go yeah but that doesn't sound anything like my organization that's fine without loss of generality 
we can replace a circle with an individual. So if you have a stakeholder, you might go, well, I don't have six circles. I have three. I've got developers, I've got testers, I've got uh, analysts. And the next level up, I've got business and I've got architects and I've got uh, finance, something like that, or law, legal, you, you name it, you tell me. So that's fine. This can work just as well when, let's say, we replace three of these circles with individuals from finance, from uh, the business, from architecture. And at this level, we're going to replace them. We might not replace them. It's really up to us. Basically, we decide how we want that representation to occur. And it's okay if we're rotating across the circles at this level. So really, there's a lot of freedom to do this in a way that makes sense to you. Likewise, it doesn't have to be symmetrical. So without loss of generality, we can replace a council with a team. You might just say, well, all of, all of this three teams, no, there's no three teams, there's one team here, but then here I've got these councils running and I'm gonna to have to have representatives of one team attending those councils. You can do that too. It doesn't have to look like um, a pizza slice. But for the Game Without Thrones, uh, you might say, well, okay, can we do this with more? And the answer is, yes, we can. And this looks a little bit like that um, Haudenosaunee diagram where there's nothing in the middle. And maybe that's fine. Maybe we've got here three business units. Each is about 60 people and uh, or, or three trains, if you like. Uh, having a train with more than 60 people is madness. Um, and we can have our engineers and our business, high level business stakeholders and so on, we can uh, have them working in instead of some of these circles. There's lots of ways of structuring this so that it maps onto our existing organization. Um, and maybe that's sufficient. We don't need to have some kind of central uh, self-management function. We'll use command and control above this level. It's fine, no reason you need to do that. But if you wanted to, well, you can complete the pizza and, and do like that. So. Um, I think just about enough said, but just to be really clear in terms of model vari variations. So we can replace circles by individuals, we can replace councils by teams and vice versa. We can grow and shrink this as necessary. There's no need for it to stay symmetrical. The different parts of the business can have different cadences. So you might have a software delivery team where really they're meeting every hour or two, they're doing a bunch of mobbing and the way this works just slightly structures the way that they divide up their day in a hand. Maybe you don't need to meet more often than once a month and so on. So um, that's kind of all I wanted to wave hands at. I have no idea how long I went. So if I've gone over time, I apologize. And I hope I'm not um, boring you, but uh, um, open the floor for questions. And maybe if we want to split into little working groups, we can there too. But let's start with uh, uh, questions across the floor and see what we get. Uh, if you are asking a question, uh, you'll need to either put it in the chat and then maybe Paula can read it out. Or um, uh, uh, if you want, she can call on you or just open your microphone, unmute and, and have at it. I got all my questions answered by Paula during oh, the talk. No. Oh, she's too smart. <laughs> I'm so trained well. Um, Brad Appleton had a question. Brad? Go for it. Yeah, let me. Okay, there we go. Hi, Peter, by the way. How are you guys, man? We've known each other a while. So um, the last few things you were saying and then some of the wording talked about, yeah, you can represent this as a hierarchy um, and referred to fractals. Um, but in terms of you know, trying to descale, are we necessarily wanting things to look more like growing a hierarchy versus expanding a, an adaptive network or chain? So um, hierarchies are really useful ways of cutting down on the number of conversations you need to have to get a decision made. So even when you have um, uh, network organizations, you, when it comes to the, uh, the flow of decisions, 
you get hierarchies forming and reforming. And the neat thing about this is you can say, well, it is representing a hierarchy, but it's a plastic one. And each level can rearrange hierarchy below it continuously in terms of refactoring to suit the changing market conditions. It's like organic chemistry rather than inorganic chemistry. Okay. You got it, you got it. So the, the, the neat thing is that when it comes to the treaty governance we were talking about before, the way that, that stuff works can be accounted for by treaty, treaty board. And you say, treaty is a fancy word, it could just be working agreement if you like. But anyway, proposals coming out of circles that get decided by councils at a particular level, usually the coordination council would be the group that would be um, trying to make those proposals hang together, but it would actually be the groupings, which I'm just call, gonna call teams for now, the teams that would be affected by a treaty have to ratify that treaty. So if uh, we decide, hey, um, uh, we actually want the decisions to be made in a different way for a particular purposes, we want to change direct responsibilities for different kinds of cross-cutting concerns, say. Um, we can do that by treaty. It can be negotiated across the teams as long as it's something that's mutually beneficial to them. The lovely thing about motivating mutual benefit that way is that then um, you don't get one team sort of zoning out and going, yeah, we already delivered our bit, so we don't care about that. If they're motivated by uh, reward for business outcomes, it doesn't have to be turning up as a bonus or as share options. It can be as simple as saying, well, if we make these numbers, then you're gonna to get to go out to dinner with the CIO. A lot of people will compete to make that happen. So um, the neat thing about that is that it motivates people to think intelligently about those workplace agreements. And then the circles and councils just become um, a structure for continuously burying them in the sense of the Haudenosaunee did. They, they would talk about um, yeah, scaling up treaties. versus out. One can be more network-like. Some people will perhaps try to scale up and create more layers of hierarchy prematurely. But I guess if you look at those numbers from the Dunbar series, you can see, well, yeah, I need to saturate this layer or this level first before I try and make another level above. Yeah. Well, look, the reason I showed the Haudenosaunee slides was uh, there is uh, uh, even a, a, an egalitarian uh, 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 society like that, there is a, a concept of hierarchy, but the hierarchy is not a command and control hierarchy. And that's the big difference. It's an autonomy in alignment right. hierarchy. So the way that, that they talked about it was that they would have a chain of treaties binding their society together, but that the treaties rust and they must, the chain of treaties must be brightened on a regular basis which is very much like business and technology should be moving daily. Here in the, in the US, there's an organization, the YMCA, that would run something that's kind of in contrast to like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, but it was like Indian nation type activity. And, you know, they got in a lawsuit because they're really kind of misappropriating it. But the governance for those was the Longhouse and Council. Yeah. Beautiful style, so that's interesting. I wasn't aware the YMCA were doing that, uh, and uh, really, I don't know if they still are. <laughs> a lot of them have gone out of business since the pandemic started. But the, the, the neat thing for us is we are being very careful to say we are not the Haudenosaunee, we're not appropriating their society in any way, shape, or form. Um, uh, our intent is inspired by their success, but uh, what we're trying to do is stuff that's much simpler than what they do. Because I need to um, Peter, David Evans had a question. Go for it, Dave. Oh, yeah. So I, I, what, my question was around the round councils and how they would relate to retrospectives. Mm -hmm. and you said a little bit, you know, maybe a suggestion of having one before the others, but I'm hoping you can help clarify a little bit for me the distinction between those role, you know, those contexts and, and why mm -hmm. you would do one versus the other when. Cool. So, um, in a version of this deck, which you can find online, um, I animated all of that, um, but I was worried that it looks complicated and it isn't actually complicated. So I, I tried to make the animation for this as simple as possible, but I may have made it more simple than it should have been. So anyway, the, the idea is that when the circles meet, 
they're basically proposing, at least in what we do with Game Without Thrones, they're proposing two kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So getting together, they're sharing, oh, well, this thing is biting us. Here's something we could do. I had an idea, that sort of stuff. Um, and so typically their proposals fit uh, one of two forms. One is they'll propose new or modified features to be delivered, which might be something like if we're in a hamburger joint, uh, all of our customers are Polynesian. We should be doing mango flavored smoothies instead of chocolate thick shakes. Um, it's something to deliver. Uh, and it needs to be prioritized against other things to deliver. Uh, or uh, proposals for working agreements or treaties. Uh, we should move the, we are the fry cooks. We should move the, the vat of hot oil to the left of the fridge refrigerator because we're all left-handed. Well, actually there's another shift where they're all right-handed. So uh, maybe that's a proposal that isn't going to fly for everybody. It's something that that group of three have decided on in their circle. So how do we get the other circles involved? That's where the round council comes in because all those proposals get taken to the council uh, or councils depending and um, the council will go, oh, okay, well, so this, this circle wants to move it to the left, this circle wants to move it to the right, but that's because of the handedness and we have different handedness for different circles so why don't we move it to the back of the room? And it's an extra couple of steps, but it's not going to be dangerous for anyone then. So that sort of revision is something that they would do. And then that revised proposal would go out to all three shifts for the hamburger joint. And they would have to all ratify it before it would come into, into uh, force. So where does that ratification happen? Well, the easiest thing is to ratify at the retrospective. Um, and if you were doing multiple levels of this, then you can stagger the council meetings so that effectively each council acts as a ratification body for, for the proposals for the council above it. Uh, okay, that's what caught my ear. I think, you know, having the retrospective after those meetings surprised me because I would imagine the insights would be coming from the retrospectives for what we'd propose. Well, it is a cycle. So I guess you could think it does, that does happen, but a lot of the insights will happen. You spend a lot more time in delivery than in retrospective. So a lot of insights will happen in casual conversation at standups and uh, working together and so on. Yeah. And so if you have the circles before the retros, then each retro is much more adaptive. It, it's more about, well, not only is this gonna be good for us, but it's gonna make it easier for us to work with these guys. And that's gonna cut a lot of problems out um, further down, you're just a week or two further down the track because we'll be ready, that sort of conversation. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Peter, how many more sessions do we have from Xscale? Is it uh, the we, that's a good question. Uh, we have um, uh, next week, actually no, at the end of this week, there's a, a, um, a session that Dobsal uh, is moderating uh, he's calling it the vinegar testers or tasters, and I like testers myself. But it's based on a a, 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 a picture of um, Buddha and Lao Tzu and Confucius meeting each other and tasting a vat of vinegar. And Confucius goes, oh, this, this wine's gone off, we should throw it out. And Buddha goes, it is bitter, but life is suffering, we should accept it. <laughs> and Lao Tzu goes, this is going really well on a salad or maybe with uh, fried yams. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, it's, it's kind of a that, that picture has a slight bias to it, but, um, uh, but the intent is to go, well, what these schools of thought, what, what do they bring to Agile? Um, I, uh, Dov and I ran a, a session on the Agile DAO this week. So let's sort of follow on from that. The next week, um, there's uh, Agile in Space, which is basically intended to be very forward looking. Uh, we have a lot of new technologies turning up, uh, AI, quantum computing, augmented reality, alga culture, 3D printed everything, lots of energy technologies. Um, and as Agilists, what we do is critical to the flow of learning and the progress of our civilization. What can we contribute to this stuff and it'll also play with ideas about uh, universal basic income. So it's a very utopian kind of session, but I wanted to do something where we could really be very forward looking and think about agile in 20 years. But I didn't want to call it agile in 20 years because that's boring. Um, so, um, 
So anyway, then um, I'm turning up in Evan Laybourne's panel session on business agility. Um, we might add a session in the last week of Feb on product agility, because we've got a whole bunch of really useful patterns there, and I alluded to them in this session. So I think we might uh, declare an extra one for that. There's one on data ops. Oh, we could actually use some of that in there too. Oh, it, well, you're doing one on data ops. That's right, I forgot. Yes, that one. Do you want to plug yeah. it now? And then we're, yeah, so um, that'll be February 22nd. The let, let's, let me look at the date real quick. That'll actually be Saturday, February 27th. Sure. Um, and I can send out a link to everyone. But it's basically how do we apply lean, agile, and DevOps to the data world, which is strangely lagging. Very cool. Okay, any other questions, Paula? Um, no. Okay, then I reckon that makes the end of a session, unless anyone's going to hold me up short. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I hope that was valuable to you. If you want to follow up in any way, uh, don't pay me. You've got my email address. Take care, all. Thanks, Peter. Here. Thank you.